you to follow along with me as I read Luke chapter 2, verses 19 through 20, which can be found on page 58 in your Pew Bible. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. Now, please turn along, or please follow along with me as I read Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, which can be found on page 201 in your Pew Bible. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish, admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It lies hidden away in a place devoid of light. Gone just long enough to lull others into a sense of false hope, that it was somehow lost amid a vast sea of dust and forgotten relics of years gone by. For 12 long months, it waited in silence, only to emerge from its year-long slumber with a festive flurry that cannot be ignored. I'm speaking, of course, of a Christmas sweater. You know the ones I'm talking about. The balk at all other garments with hues of red and green so pronounced that they call out for a new color spectrum to be created just so we could find names for all the different versions of red and green that are contained within them whose yuletide fervor can be seen from space. Today, on the other side of Christmas, it marks the mass exodus of those pinnacles of outerwear. When they get put back in the bin with the ornaments, with the Christmas village, and with the Santa hat wearing singing Billy Bass that you received from that company Christmas party 15 years ago and have never put up. But what if it didn't? What if that loud Christmas sweater not only stayed in the weekly clothing rotation, but became a daily part of your wardrobe? How might the world receive you if you chose to display your Christmas excitement through your clothing, as loud as it is, all year long? Now, it seems like a funny hypothetical kind of scenario but for the Apostle Paul this idea is not far from what he has in mind for members of the early church and for each of us today in the book of Colossians Paul writes that as God's chosen people people who are both holy and dearly loved by God we are called to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness with humility and meekness and patience and above all with love for Paul these things are more than just ideals that we should believe in that they're more than just traits that we should try to exhibit we should think of them like the clothes that we put on in the morning that we iron and starch and match that we take great care to make sure don't get messed up. That we dry clean only when we're supposed to. 
that we accessorize around. These things like our clothes should be the first thing that people see when they look at us. An outward, unhidden display of our faith and what God began for us when Christ was born that first Christmas morning. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and love. These are the layers that we're called to wear as Christians. The high fashion of faith. Worn to be seen and to be noticed as loudly and as brightly as that Christmas sweater. There's not a single one of these qualities that we can bear alone, that we can hold to on to by ourselves. Every single one of these things requires other people to be used most effectively. Compassion, kindness, and humility are qualities that we show toward others that we interact with. Meekness and patience are qualities that we display toward others that interact with us. And love, love does both. What Paul is describing for this early church is their uniform. Their Christmas, all year uniform. A uniform that identifies us by the job that we are called to do and the Savior who chose us for it. And we are called to wear it all the time. Not just to church or on Christmas, but always. There are many of us in this room who know what it's like to wear a uniform. Soldiers, our kids shared these things. Soldiers, police officers, firefighters, nurses, clergy. To put on something that shows to the world what we do, and who and what we are a part of. That's what Paul is talking about here. He wants people to be able to look at us and by what we are wearing, know immediately to whom our hearts belong. To instantly tell that we follow and worship the one born in a stable, surrounded by animals and greeted by shepherds with stories of angels singing. If you've ever worn a uniform, if you've ever worn an ID badge, you know what it's like for people to look at you and instantly know your role. You can't hide from it when you have these kind of things on. Sometimes that's a good thing. I've watched soldiers in uniform be saluted when they get off of airplanes. I have seen families in hospital rooms let out a sigh of relief when they finally see someone in a white lab coat walk through the door. I've had strangers ask me to pray for them in parking lots because I happened to be wearing my robe or because they noticed that my hospital ID said chaplain or clergy under my name. For me, one of the clearest examples of what positive things can happen, of how important it is for us to wear our uniform, came to me when I was on a flight back from the Holy Land. When I was coming back on the airplane, I'm sitting in the seat, and up in my carry-on, I've placed that red stole, the one in the middle with the big green crosses on it. I bought that in Bethlehem, and I wanted to make sure that if I lost my luggage, I wasn't going to lose that. I wasn't flying all the way back to Bethlehem to get another one. So I wanted to make sure that that was safe. So I tucked it in the overhead bed in my bag. And as I was sitting talking to my wife, the lady in front of me overheard. I guess she overheard us talking about the church that I served and she turns around, just whips her head around. This is a, an older, very devout Catholic woman who looks at me and asks me a question that I've never been asked before. She says, you're a minister. Can you bless my rosary beads? I thought about it for a minute. 
And I looked at this woman and I said, well, ma'am, I am a minister of the gospel. I am not a Catholic priest. I'm a Baptist. She got these beads in the Vatican and was on the same flight as me and wanted to get them blessed before she touched down back home. She couldn't find a priest, which seems impossible to me in the Vatican. <laughs> and so she turned to the next best thing, the random Southern Baptist minister sitting behind her. And I told her, I said, ma'am, if, if I can ask for God to bless you, I can ask for God to bless your prayers that you say. And it's up to you to decide if that's good enough. <laughs> she said, it is. And so I reached up in the overhead bin and I took down the one piece of my uniform that I had with me. That red stole. And the second that I put it on and looked at her, this woman was weeping because all at once what was happening in that moment at 30,000 feet became real and sacred and holy and she wasn't the only one because when I opened my eyes after asking God to bless her and to bless her prayers in the future I looked up to see a row down the aisle of older Catholic ladies with rosary beads needing them to be blessed by the man wearing the red stole in row E. For these people, what we wear, our uniform that shows who God is to us, matters. For the people who don't know us, that uniform's all they need to see for them to feel comforted, to find hope, to feel connected to us, and even to feel connected to God. Paul knows that when we choose to wear compassion, when we choose to wear kindness and humility and meekness and patience and love, that for many people who see these things, it has the power to be both life-giving and transformative for them and for us. But Paul also knows full well that there's a risk that there's a cost involved to wearing our faith like our clothes. When he writes these words, he is doing so from prison, a place where he finds himself because of his willingness to wear his uniform of faith boldly for all to see. Just as a uniform can be a positive sight for some, it can create an intense feeling of anger or resentment from other people. Many of you who served our country in Vietnam probably remember what it's like to come back and have someone see that uniform and not think positive thoughts or say positive things to you. Many police officers know exactly what it's like to walk into a room and have that entire room go silent when people look up and see that uniform. Police officers train to be on alert to violence that might come their way simply because of that uniform. When I received the robe that I am wearing this morning, the minister who spoke at my ordination said something to me that has proven true time and time again. She said, Robert, this robe is going to be more than a robe for other people. For some, it's going to be a projector screen. For all of their issues with God, for every time they feel like God has let them down, for every hypocritical pastor in their life, they're going to project that onto you. That anger, that resentment, that fear, and that frustration you are wearing in a very real way to those people. And she told me that even then, it's worth it. That it might cost my life. That it would cost my life. But it was worth it. Paul knows firsthand 
the truth of Jesus' words when he promises, promises to his disciples that because of him, they're going to be hated and beaten and jailed, that they're going to be persecuted, that they're going to have their lives threatened. Paul knows this because it's happening to him right then as he is penning these words as he still tells this church and each one of us that wearing these things, displaying our faith for all to see and acting upon these things is not just worth the risk and worth the cost, but required. For Paul, these things, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, love are not just worn to be seen, they are worn to be used. Many uniforms and the individual pieces that make them up also serve a far greater purpose than just to be seen. Often the elements of these uniforms, like the spiritual clothing that Paul talks about, play an active role in doing our jobs. Think about a paratrooper. That parachute is not just an accessory. It's a part of the uniform, but it has a very active role to play if they want to land on the ground safely and slowly enough. A fire helmet looks cool. As a little boy, I always wanted to be a fire fireman. Always. It looks cool, but it's shaped the way it is on purpose so that the debris falling won't hurt the fireman. And that back part, you may not have known this, is shaped the way it is so that the torrential water that they're spraying won't go down the back of their suit so that they're not waterlogged while they're trying to rescue people. That hat is shaped the way it is because it performs a function. I knew a man who was an electrical line worker and he used to roll his gloves up every night to make sure that no air could go out big rubber gloves and he told me that he did so because if there was any way that air could come out electricity could come in those gloves were what kept him walking a thin literal line between life and death and even a minister even I in my uniform have active clothing though we don't use it so much for that anymore the stoles that you see here for a long time long long time ago these were used when people got married they would be tied around the clasped hands of brides and grooms as a symbol that god had united them not that minister it was intended when people saw this that they saw god not the person in it and even that was active that's what paul's talking about he doesn't want us to just wear it he wants us to do these things. And every single one, if you really think about it, every single one of these spiritual pieces of clothing that we are called to put on when we wake up in the morning, that we are called to show to the world when we walk out that door. Paul didn't make these things up. They didn't come from a vacuum or out of nowhere. Paul shows us how they fit because he knows that Christ wore them first. Christ modeled all of that clothing for us in spite of the cost involved. Think about it. Christ showed us what it looked like to wear kindness. Every time he cared for those that the rest of society discarded. When he touched lepers clean, knowing that his hands were the first hands that had touched them in years. When he called out to a tax collector in a tree, a man that the rest of the people hated and invited himself over for dinner at that man's house. Jesus showed us what it was like to wear kindness. When he stood over a guilty woman and called out to a jeering, bloodthirsty crowd, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Christ showed us what it was like to wear humility when he demanded to be baptized by John the Baptist instead of the other way around. When he washed the feet of his disciples, when he called the little children unto him, he showed what it was like to wear patience. What this looked like as he continued to care and teach disciples that missed the point over and over and over again and kept asking each other, who is this guy? 
that he can stop storms. How is this possible? Jesus bore with them. That's patience. When he taught that forgiveness is not just a one-shot deal, but something that we're called to do 70 times, seven times. Jesus showed us what meekness looked like as he prayed through tears in the Garden of Gethsemane. You can see that in the window there. He showed us what it was like to wear meekness as he wept when Lazarus died, as he allowed himself to be tried and crucified. And most importantly, when he came into this world, born a king in a stable, surrounded by no one that the world would deem important. For Christ, wearing these things meant doing these things. It meant being held accountable and acting accordingly. Because there's also something else that happens when we wear a uniform. We are held accountable. Paul knows this too. This is part of why he says that we must teach one another and admonish one another. If you are wearing kindness while at the same time being unkind, there's a problem. It seems like a very simple thing to say, but there are a lot of conflicts in our world that could have been prevented if someone would recognize the truth in that statement. If you are wearing humility while bragging about your own greatness, there is a problem. If you are wearing patience while at the same time doing nothing but whine and complain, there is a problem. It would be like a fireman standing next to a fire and just watching it. It would be like me wearing this robe, going outside and then yelling at everybody that I thought was walking too slow in the crosswalk. They're going to look at me wearing that and it ain't going to look right. It's something's messed up. And it doesn't look right because it is in those moments that our uniform, our spiritual clothes, they don't fit right. They bunch up in the wrong places. They droop down where they're not supposed to. And if we're not careful, they are in danger of falling off completely, exposing to the world who we really are if we are not wearing them correctly. When we choose the clothes we wear, we got to make sure they fit. That who we are on the inside matches how they cover us. This is why Paul stresses that our hearts and what dwells inside of us is so important. Paul wants to make sure that if we're going to wear all that stuff, humility and kindness and meekness and patience and love and compassion, that they fit the way they're supposed to. That we're not swimming in them or sucking in our stomachs just to pull it down over our head. Paul says we must let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. To do this, we've got to forgive even the people in our own church. Notice that that's who Paul's talking about. You need to forgive those around you in that church that are saying stuff about you. We must bear with one another, even if they've hurt us in the past. And again, Paul's talking to a people about those sitting beside them. Because Paul knows what it's like to have to be forgiven for his past. He persecuted Christians before Christ called him. He knew what it was like to have to forgive those who complained against him. What it was like to ask others to believe that he had changed and to bear with him. If our, for our clothes to fit, we must let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. The word of Christ must inform all that we say and all that we do. We've got to treasure those words. To hold on to them and revisit them, to ponder them, and to act upon them. When we worship, it must be our only response to those words in our heart. Every song we sing and every prayer that we offer must flow from our own gratitude of the words of Christ that were given to us. Who we are inside matters. And if we don't allow the Prince of Peace to rule in our hearts, if we don't allow the Word of Christ to dwell within us, then all our efforts to try to wear our clothing of faith, our uniform, compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience and love, aren't going to fit. 
So how do we do this? How do we make sure that our faith fits both inside and out? What does it look like? And the answer lies before us on the table. In the experiences of those first witnesses to that miracle birth at Christmas. In Mary, in those shepherds. As they emerge, as we do right now, on the other side of Christmas morning. When we look at their response, when it was all over, we see clearly what Paul is speaking about and hoping for his church 60 years later. What he's hoping for us 2,018 years later. What it looks like to wear our faith like our clothes and to turn our inward self into a place where the peace of Christ rules and the word of Christ dwells richly. It's the shepherds. It's the shepherds that show us what faith on the outside, what wearing that uniform looks like. And it's Mary who demonstrates, demonstrates the inward shift that we got to make in order for those clothes to fit. Those shepherds leave that manger wearing their faith for all to see, sharing the good news, glorifying and praising God. It's impossible to witness those shepherds and not see their joy, their faith in Christ as clearly as if they were wearing those things, as clearly as if they were wearing the loudest Christmas sweater ever, one of those with neon blinking lights. The shepherds don't wait to worship. They don't wait to give thanks to God. They do so even as they walk back to the life that they left behind that night. When we look at Mary in her after Christmas state, we see her left pondering and treasuring all of what she has heard in her heart. Paul tells us we're called to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell within us richly. Mary does exactly these things as she treasures the words that have been revealed to her. These words of hope and truth about her, who her new baby is is something she's going to hold on to tightly. Something that she remembers, that she returns to. Something that she allows to dwell within her and inform her experience each and every day after that moment. That memory is not just for Christmas. It's an all the time memory. Now it is so easy as we leave Christmas behind, as we begin a new year and make our resolutions, most of which we will break, as we shelve our Christmas decorations and our gaudy Christmas sweaters, it's easy for us to also put away with them our sense of awe at what Christ brought into the world that first Christmas morning. Like those sweaters, we wear these things outside for a season and eventually we store them away to resume life as usual. What I hope for us this morning is what those shepherds and Mary showed as they continue to hold tight to their experience of Christmas, even though the day itself came and went. What Paul urges his new church to do, to continue to wear our faith outside of ourselves so that others will see it. To have our spiritual uniform match perfectly to the beating of our hearts where we allow Christ to dwell and to share these gifts despite the cost in such a way that it is absolutely impossible not to look at us and see our faith in the gift that came on Christmas morning. I know that Christmas is over, but if we are truly God's chosen, if we are truly holy and beloved, we must live as if it is always upon us, like the clothes on our back. Amen. Our benediction is as obvious as it is difficult to do. We need to take a look, all of us, myself included, at what we are wearing today. To ask ourselves if when people look at us, if they will really see those things, if they will really see our compassion, if they will really see our patience, our meekness, our humility. To look inside of ourselves and ask ourselves if we are really living in such a way that we are allowing Christ to dwell within us richly, 
that we are allowing the Word of God to be a part of who we are. Odds are, when we do this honestly, we're going to find ourselves wanting. And so, as we leave this place, may we do so recognizing that it is for that reason that Christ came to begin with, not because we were perfect, but because we needed Him to be able to put on the things that He showed us how to wear. So when we leave this place, with all the people that you encounter, may you do so like shepherds who can't help but celebrate. May you do so like Mary, daily returning to the memories of the truths of the words of God. Amen.